But when we eat the glyphosate, either in the plant or because of the contaminated groundwater, we also end up chelating some of the nutrients in our bodies, making it less available for our health and protection. And there's a lot of diseases that are associated with mineral deficiencies. Now, the Roundup itself is also toxic to humans and mammals. In fact, it interferes with endocrine development. It can cause, in certain rat studies, lower sperm counts, uh, abnormal or dead sperm, uh, lower testosterone level. So when we see the genetically modified Roundup-ready soy being fed to animals and causing reproductive problems, we don't know if it's the GMO component or the high residues of Roundup. In addition, the glyphosate in Roundup doesn't just dissipate. In fact, uh, two quarts, one, one in the United States and one in France, told Monsanto they had to stop saying that their Roundup was biodegradable. It actually accumulates in the soil and can last up to three years or longer. So the more we spray with Roundup, it has an accumulating effect so that anything that's, that's planted in that same field after Roundup can also uptake the Roundup. And it can be reactivated when you put in fertilizers. Even, they've even found glyphosate in the manure of chickens. So now if you spread chicken manure on a field you, to, to create increased nutrients, the glyphosate might tie up the nutrients, making it harder to nourish the plants. And we are flooding our country with this glyphosate. In fact, the weeds are developing resistance, so people are pouring on more glyphosate and more glyphosate, which is the active ingredient Roundup. One of the interesting aspects of genetic engineering is the uh, any time a scientist discovers a problem, they're attacked. It doesn't matter how much credibility they have, how, what level of publication they put it in, they're attacked, sometimes they lose their funding, sometimes they're fired or lose tenure. I'll give you an example. The UK government wanted to prove to a skeptical public that GMOs were safe. So they put out a grant proposal trying to find someone who can design testing to show that GMOs were safe. 28 different scientists applied. They gave it to Dr. Arpad Pustai, the world's leading researcher in his field. He worked at one of the top nutritional research institutes in the country, or in the world, and was leading about 20 or 30 people on this grant. He fed genetically modified potatoes to rats as part of the protocol. The potatoes were engineered to produce an insecticide. Now, he knew this insecticide was harmless to rats. He had fed huge amounts of the insecticide to rats in previous experiments. In fact, for this experiment, one group of rats was fed the GM potato that produced its insecticide. One group of rats were fed natural potatoes, and a third group, natural potatoes, plus the insecticide spiked directly into the diet. Only those that ate the GM potatoes got sick. So what was the cause? It was not the insecticide. It was somehow the process of genetic engineering which caused the massive damage to the rats, including potentially precancerous cell growth in their digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, and damaged immune system after only 10 days. He went public with his concerns and was a hero for about two days at his prestigious institute. Then two phone calls were allegedly placed from the UK Prime Minister's office, forwarded through the receptionist to the director of the institute. The next day, Dr. Pustai was fired from his job after 35 years and silenced with threats of a lawsuit. His team was disbanded, they never implemented his protocols, and his institute, plus the UK government, launched a campaign to destroy his reputation in order to protect the reputation of biotechnology. After seven months, by an order of parliament, his gag order was lifted, he got his data back, and it's now published. And it remains the most in-depth animal feeding study yet published on GMOs, implicating the process itself as causing harm. In Moscow, when the scientists discovered that Roundup-ready soy fed to female rats caused more than half of their babies to die within three weeks, she was told by her boss, who was being pressured by his boss, no more studies on GMOs. In fact, documents were burnt on her desk, samples were stolen. One of her colleagues tried to comfort her by saying, well, maybe the GM soy will solve the overpopulation problem. One of the criticisms that was leveled at the Russian scientists 
which has merit, is that she never conducted a biochemical analysis of the feed. So maybe there was some toxin mixed with the GM soy that caused this astounding death rate. But after she had done the research three times with similar results, coincidentally, the rat chow, which was being fed to all of the rats in her Russian facility, switched to be based on GM soy. So she couldn't do any more studies because she had no controls. But after two months, she had the brilliant idea to ask her colleagues, what's the infant mortality rate in your mice studies? Let me say that again. But after two months, she had the brilliant idea to ask her colleagues after two months, what was the infant mortality in the rats that you're working with? It had skyrocketed to over 55%, suggesting that it wasn't a particular toxin in her batch, but it's a more generic aspect of genetically modified soy. When Dr. Carrasco in Argentina linked Roundup to birth defects, both in amphibians and possibly in humans, he was immediately attacked and four people showed up at his place of business and tried to interrogate him in a very aggressive manner. Time and time again, when scientists discover adverse findings about GMOs, they're attacked viciously in the press, uh, through their colleagues. It happens so often that many scientists just give up and they, they refuse to do any more research about GMOs. One of the myths of biotechnology is that GMOs are going to feed the world. Actually, they work against feeding a hungry world. If something is to feed the world, well, first of all, it has to increase yields. It has to be reliable. And yield increase actually has to be a, a way of solving the hunger problem. It also has to be healthy and better than competing technologies. GMOs fail on every count. First of all, the average GM crop reduces yield. It does not increase yield. Second, increased yield actually isn't the solution to hunger today. We have more food per person than any time in human history, but a billion people go to bed hungry or malnourished. It's a question of distribution and economic access. Also, GMOs are not reliable. Take the case of BT cotton in India. That Monsanto has convinced millions of farmers to plant BT cotton. And unfortunately, it doesn't always perform. In fact, the UK Daily Mail estimates that more than 125,000 farmers who planted BT cotton and were unable to even repay the high interest debts that they took out for the expensive seeds and associated chemicals committed suicide. Now, this is a catastrophe. Some people put the number closer to 200,000. So this is an example of what's happening in the developing country, and they're trying to convince us that GMOs are going to help the developing world. GMOs are also not better than competing technologies if you're trying to increase yields. In fact, studies on millions and millions of farmers show that sustainable techniques can increase yields by an average of 79%. Some studies show that organic agriculture can increase yields by 100%, even 300% in developing countries. If you look at the Rodale Institute, they did a side-by-side -side study with organic soy and corn versus non-organic. And they found that they actually have comparable yields, but the organic is better during times of adverse weather and also has less inputs. In January 1999 Biotechnology Conference in San Francisco, Arthur Anderson, a company that had consulted with Monsanto, they were also Enron's consultant, revealed how they had worked with their executives to create their plan. They asked Monsanto executives to describe their ideal future in 15 to 20 years. And the Monsanto executives described a world in which 100% of all the commercial seeds were genetically engineered and patented. And Anderson worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. At the same conference, another biotechnology company was projecting that within five years, by 2004, they would have a 95% replacement of all natural seeds. So the biotechnology industry is planning to replace nature. Fortunately, consumer concern has stopped that moving train. About three weeks after this conference, the gag order on Dr. Pustai was lifted. Within one week, 159 column feet of articles were written in Europe. Within a month, 750 articles were written. One editor said it divided society into two warring blocks. Within 10 weeks, the tipping point of consumer rejection had been achieved. Within a single week, in the end of April, 1999, Virtually every major food company committed to stop using GM ingredients for their European brands, but not in the U.S., because it wasn't reported in the U.S. According to Project Censored, 
the Arpad Pustai story was one of the ten most underreported events of the year. In the United States, if you have asked the average American, have you ever eaten a genetically modified food in your life? 60% say no, 15% say I don't know. So three quarters of Americans do not realize that they're eating GMOs in nearly every meal. The fact that GMOs flourish on the basis of consumer ignorance leaves the biotechnology industry extremely vulnerable. If some event or campaign were to increase the visibility of GMOs, especially the health dangers, we could see a tipping point in the United States like we've seen in Europe. In fact, bovine growth hormone, the genetically engineered drug that's injected into cows to increase milk supply, that's being ushered out because of consumer concern. You see, when you inject cows with bovine growth hormone, it changes the milk. There's more pus, more antibiotics used, more bovine growth hormone, and of greatest concern, more IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1 a very powerful hormone which is linked to cancer. Now milk contains IGF-1 anyway, and milk drinkers have higher levels of IGF-1, and those with high levels of IGF-1 are more likely to have breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon and lung cancer. And it's in much higher levels in milk from cows treated with bovine growth hormone. I'll let you connect the dots. But as we explain this to consumers, their concern about drug milk has caused the manufacturers and dairies to kick it out. Walmart has kicked it out of its store brand, Starbucks out of its stores, Dannon and Yoplait, Kroger's, uh, Publix. In fact, most of the major dairies in the United States have stopped using bovine growth hormone because of consumer concern. So our campaign for healthier eating in America is now designed to create a tipping point against all GMOs in the food supply. In fact, it's already, it's already happening. The fastest growing store brand claim in 2009 was GMO free. And, and Supermarket News, a big trade journal for the food industry, predicted that 2010 would see an unprecedented upsurge of consumer awareness and concern about GMOs. And as I travel around the country, as I do every year, I see more informed and enthusiastic activists and consumers getting the word out about GMOs. So we now are equipping them with strategies and tools and speaker training and we have a campaign to hit the tipping point of consumer rejection in the United States between 10-10-10, that's October 10th, 2010, and 11-11-11, within a year, a month, and a day. So I invite you to come to our website at healthiereating.org to get involved, to sign up for a Healthier Eating Pledge, to get the tools to invite others to do the same, so that together we can create a tipping point. You see, we only need about 5% of U.S. shoppers. We think that's more than enough to create the tipping point. And 15 million people, 5.6 million households, that's easy. Why is the number so low? Because GMOs give no consumer benefits. There's no reason why a company would say, well, I need to keep my GMOs because it has better mouthfeel or sweetness or shelf life. If a small percentage of people were to reject GMOs, it would become a pure marketing liability. The companies don't even have to switch recipes in order to get rid of GMOs. They can just use the non-GM corn and soy, as many companies have done already, like Whole Foods for its store brands, like many companies in the natural food industry. There's also a new third-party verified seal called Non-GMO Project Verified, which is being put on products that show that the non-GMO claim has been third-party verified. So the entire natural food industry is getting on board, mothers are getting on board, doctors and medical organizations are prescribing non-GMO diets, many spiritual and religious groups are saying that GMO really means God move over, and they're against it. We have enough people to eliminate GMOs, we just have to get the word out to those who are already receptive. If we need only 15 million Americans, consider that 28 million Americans already buy organic food on a regular basis, 87 million people are strongly against GMOs, and 159 million people, 53% of Americans, the majority, say they would avoid GMOs if they were labeled. So we have a non-GMO shopping guide to help people make healthier non-GMO choices. So go to non-gmoshoppingguide.com to see for yourself which products are non-GMO and how to avoid them. Right now, it is legal to call something non-GMO, but the Codex negotiation team in 2010 in May, went to a conference in Quebec armed with a new proposal that could ultimately make it very difficult 
for people to label something as non-GMO or even at, keep the requirements in Europe for GMO labeling.